and this talk. Uh, Ian Campbell is the uh, Emeritus Professor of uh, Scottish and 19th century literature at Edinburgh University, a large field which he has um, uh, explored with great uh, uh, ingenuity and, uh, uh, and uh, passed on uh, to many people um, his, uh, his love of literature. I have two qualifications for, giving, for doing this introduction, one that I've known Ian for a long time, and he is a valued friend. Um, and I've heard him speak on many occasions on many subjects and always um, found that uh, he, he knows more than I do. Uh, oh. and, um, and I'm also an example, not a very good example of Ian's policy of improvement because Ian likes to, if he finds that you're, you're lacking in some area, some book you haven't read, he'll encourage you to do so and sometimes he even present you with a copy of the book. Uh, he gave me a copy of, um, uh, a second hand copy of Red Gauntlet because um, I didn't remember reading it and I enjoyed it a great deal, of course, but I was a bit suspicious at the end when um, that Ian Campbell had given me this book and at the end, a General Campbell is the one who sort of tidies up most of the loose ends. I wondered if it was a slight sort of, um, uh, what it would be nice to see the, ca the clan turn and turn out, out in such a good light. Um, so this, I think Ian has been, loves to spread his knowledge. He uh, his talks energetically to lots of groups out with the university as, as well as in his distinguished career within the university. Um, he spent, well, I think all his um, academic life, uh, well, apart from undergraduate in Edinburgh University, but he's formed um, many links elsewhere and he has um, traveled widely, sometimes for, you know, on academic business and other times for pleasure. He, he is a, a, a great traveler. He prefers to travel by train whenever possible and by tram. Um, and he can do so to places like um, Echo Fecken to, uh, to when he has business with the, the house where Thomas Carlyle was born uh, and also to London where the, the house uh, is in, in Cheney Row where, the, um, where Thomas and Jane Carlyle spent much of their, their marriage. Uh, I don't quite sure if trains run to um, Walter Scott's Abbotsford or to um, um, places like um, uh, Arbuthnot for the connections with uh, uh, with um, uh, with uh, Lewis Grassic Gibbon, but uh, I'm sure that Ian finds it will find a way. The um, and the Carlisle letters are a collaboration between Edinburgh University and. The, universe, the Duke University in the United States. So Ian has to resort to air travel when going there uh, for on, on academic business or visiting some of his friends in the United States. Um, and um, one way of Ian's uh, way of sort of sharing knowledge, encouraging people to uh, to take an interest in things that are interesting, was to the running of the Carlisle Society in Edinburgh, in Edinburgh, um, and that consisted of all sorts of interesting speakers coming to talk to a group of people who varied from those with very little knowledge of Carlisle to those who were experts in in, in the subject. So. Um, it's very sad that it was brought, it was going to end anyway, but it was brought to a, a very sort of sudden premature conclusion by COVID as so much else was, uh, which was we, <laughs> really a, a number of people who attended who expressed their, there's something is missing in their lives now that uh, the Carlisle Society no longer meets. Um, amongst all the other literary pursuits that Ian has followed, the Carlisle letters, have been a constant theme, um, often appearing that the books at a, a rate of about um, one a year. The, the physical uh, the letters are uh, in this sort of very, you know, very well, simple but attractive sort of format. They are they are made for a long life and uh, very nicely produced and marvels of scholarship. Um, 
they are also now excitingly produced uh, uh, online and to have this sort of uh, this resource available that, that anyone can access and that it's free is quite a remarkable sort of uh, uh, and wonderful achievement. Uh, it really is. Uh, and uh, this whole process has sort of uh, been going on throughout Ian's career and um, I'm sure he will continue doing lots of things after the, the last volume has been published, but uh, that is a well, a wonderful, um, a wonderful event, and I hand over to Ian to to give us some more details about the the, the correspondence between Thomas and Jane Carlyle and to their many friends. Thank you, Michael. Right. Right. Can I start by thanking the University of Mainz for making this possible? I've visited Mainz often. I've been the guest of Frau Ruwerts often, and I've greatly appreciated getting to know that side of Germany, where yes, the trams are nice, but the people have been very welcoming, and I've always enjoyed my contact with it. As Michael suggested, studying Carlisle is a great way to learn about the world because both Carlyles had friends from all over the world. And the more you study their long lives and the correspondence that goes with them, the more you realize just how interconnected it was possible to be, even before air travel or long distance travel of any kind. To put this in context for you, Thomas Carlyle was born in 1795. So he was there in the 18th century, it's hard to believe. And he died in 1881, 1795 to 1881. A long, long life. The first 35 years of which were spent in Scotland and the last in Chelsea in London. He's often referred to as the Sage of Chelsea because when he and Jane were in their little house, down in the suburbs in the southwest, they were visited by a constellation of eminent Victorians and it became a great centre of literary London. But editing the letters reminds us that that was only half their life. Jane Carlyle's dates are 1801, she's just into the 19th century, to 1866. 1801, to 1866. Her father was a doctor in Haddington, which is about 20 kilometers out of Edinburgh. Thomas Carlyle's father was a working man, a stonemason, and then later on a farmer. So Jane came from what you might call the lower edge of the middle class, and Thomas came definitely from the working classes in Scotland. Both of them benefited from the Scottish educational system, as indeed people still do, I did, going to small village schools and then going to more advanced schools. And in the case of Thomas, going to university and then teaching in a school, whereas Jane finished her education but continued to read it and teach herself in a variety of languages until she met Thomas and they spent some of the earlier years of their courtship reading in German, sorry, in Spanish and Italian and French. So from the start, although they came from modest backgrounds, they were educated, intelligent, and when they started their correspondence, they were armed not just with ideas, but with a wealth of literary reference. This is the first letter in volume one, and it dates to 1812. Jane to Mary Welsh, my dear Mrs. Welsh, I draw and play with her. I go to Mr. Brown's school for writing, 
I have not yet become geography, but I expect I will soon, and I send you a specimen of my drawing, and I am yours affectionately, Jane B. Welsh. That's a girl of 12, writing from Haddington. And the first letter of Thomas in volume one of the Carlisle letters is June 1813, when he writes a very undergraduate student letter to his friends, telling them how he's doing, because by then he has left his little village and is living rather impecuniously as a student in Edinburgh. So what we have are the correspondences of two people who came from modest, modest backgrounds. Very small town in the case of Carlisle, small town in the case of Jane. But they both of them benefited from free education, universal education, which was one of the gifts that the Church of Scotland gave to Scotland, every parish to have a school. And if you were lucky with your schoolmaster, you could go on to great things from a very modest start. And that's where Carlyle was lucky. He was able, with the aid of clergymen and other friends, to go to university. His father, who had very little money, spent the money so that the eldest son could go to university and to the church. Because, like many people, the parents wanted the eldest to go to the church. And that's what Carlyle was destined for. But alas, soon after he reached Edinburgh University, his religious faith took a severe dent and he gave up the church in favour first with science and then with literature. By the time the Carlisle letters are fully formed towards the 1815 onwards, we see two intelligent, sparky people. And by 1820, the two lives have come together. Carlisle has gone to Haddington and met this startling and clever girl. And by 1826, after many, many letters were exchanged, they're engaged and will be married in the autumn. So that's the background to where these letters came from. Two small town people, well educated for their class, who discovered each other, discovered a mutual attraction. The love letters of Thomas and Jane Carlyle in the early 1820s are wonderful reading and then married and settled in 1826 in Edinburgh. One of the reasons why this great sequence of letters is so valuable for scholars today is that Edinburgh at the time was a place that you simply wanted to be. Writing later in life, Carlyle explains, in my student days, the chosen promenade of Edinburgh was Princess Street, or the east end of it to and fro, westward as far as Frederick Street, or further if you wanted. You could have the, on a bright afternoon in its highest bloom, preferably between 4 and 5 p.m., everyone who was brightest in Edinburgh seemed to have stepped out to enjoy in the pure air the finest city prospect in the world. The crowd was lively enough. Brilliant, many coloured, many voiced, clever looking, beautiful and graceful young women, a conspicuous element. A crowd altogether elegant, polite, and at its ease, though on parade. A quite pretty kind of natural concert of march, into which, if at leisure and carefully enough dressed, as some of us seldom were, you could introduce yourself and flow for a ton or two into the general flood. As for me, I never could afford to promenade or linger there, and only a few times happened to float leisurely through on my way somewhere else, which perhaps makes it look all the brighter now in far off memory, being as rare as it surely seems to me. Nothing of the same kind now remains in Edinburgh. Already in 1832, you in vain sought and inquired where the general promenade is now, the general promenade was and remains nowhere. 
That's an old Carlyle writing in 1866, looking back on his student days. But it evokes the wonderful privilege of being in Edinburgh in the time of Sir Walter Scott, when Francis Jeffrey is just rising into prominence, a lawyer who's editing the Edinburgh Review, when the Edinburgh publishing industry is at its peak, when people like Christopher North are editing with Francis Jeffrey, Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine, when Sir Walter Scott and the Edinburgh Review are in full strength, the 1810 to 1830 period is a dazzling one in Edinburgh. And Carlyle and Jane were both lucky to be on the edge of that political ferment. In 1834, with very little money, they took the risk of settling in Chelsea. Carlyle, the sage of Chelsea, Carlyle de Jane took a little house in Chelsea because in those days it was an unfashionable place to be. It was thought to be damp down by the river. And that's highly ironic now, because if you go to Carlyle's house in Chelsea, which is open by the National Trust and which I do recommend to you, you will find that the street is among the richest streets in London. And these old, old houses are inconceivably expensive if you want to buy one. But when the Carlyles went there, it was where you went if you didn't have much money. And Thomas and Jane, recently married, settled down. He began to produce a stream of literature and she a stream of letters. Their letters got more and more frequent until all through the decades up to Jane's death in 1866, there's a steady stream of correspondence. Now you may ask, why the stream and why do we have it? As a window into literary life in both Scotland and England in the 19th century, to have 12,000 plus surviving letters, 50 volumes of the Carlyle Letters edition, to have so many letters is extraordinary. And it's not a simple story as to how we have so many. But I can tell you briefly what happened. Jane died very suddenly in 1866, while Carlyle was in Edinburgh, being installed as Lord Rector of the University. He was in such shock after losing Jane, that he started collecting back all Jane's letters from his friends, his correspondents, and from friends of friends. He begged back Jane's letters because he intended to edit them and publish them. And indeed, with his help of his niece, Mary, he did a pretty good job with the letters he had in his lifetime. So a corpus of Carlyle letters from Jane already existed in his lifetime, ready for him to edit. Many of them are now in the National Library of Scotland, and they formed the, a core of the material we in Edinburgh had to deal with. But then when Carlyle died in 1881, his niece Mary, who had been his right hand for the last 10 years of his life, because his hand shook so badly he couldn't write, she took dictation and her husband Alexander and she begged back Thomas's letters from the people who had received them. And they built up a huge corpus and that's where the greater part of the 10,000 plus letters that we have now came. They were gathered together. And by the time Alexander Carlyle died in 1932, there was an enormous corpus which Sotheby's sold and many of them found their way straight to the National Library. The other great collections of Carlyle letters, Thomas and Jane, Edinburgh University Library, the British Library, the Victoria and Albert, the Huntington, Harvard, New York Public Library, and other collections spanning the whole world. There are some in Russia, there are some in continental Europe. And one of the great challenges of the Carlyle Letters edition 
was to start making sense of where these dispersed letters had been. And every few weeks, another letter would pop up in a sale room. And as the project went on, the value of these letters crept up and up and up, and it became harder to make sure they went into public hands. We were incredibly lucky, the editorial team. In America, Charles Richard Sanders wrote all around the world, air mails in the early 1960s. Do you have any Carlisle letters in your university or your library? If so, may I have a photocopy? And with slow patience, he built up a library of a photocopy of every known Carlisle letter that had come into hands. And in a fireproof filing cabinet in Durham, North Carolina, that has been added to steadily ever since. The Carlisle family, the Carlisles died childless, but there are still many Carlisles. They have been incredibly generous to us because Carlisle papers, they landed up in family hands. They have made them available to the editors of the letters. And in that way, we've been able to patch through gaps in the others. And if you do have the time and the patience to sit down, you can find that the Carlisle story from both Thomas and Jane runs almost seamlessly through the decades, up to Jane's letters ending in 66 and his in 81. It's been a great privilege to have such a run of letters. What we do in the editing, we first try to transcribe them, which you might think is easy. You wouldn't think so if you saw Jane's handwriting. Remember that letters were an expensive luxury in the early 19th century. You wrote a letter, but the person who received it paid for it. And a letter could cost a shilling, which for many people was a lot of money. And yet, Thomas's family, who had very little money, still corresponded with him regularly while he was at university and thereafter. After stamps came in, letters became a little easier to afford and pass. Carlisle grumbled that it had cost him something between an hour and an hour and a half a day, the coming of the penny post, because there were so many letters, but that has been to our advantage, because reading the letters day by day, we can follow in the footsteps of a great Victorian writer. And reading her letters day by day, we can see through Jane's eyes what it was like to be at the middle of the spider's web of friends and acquaintances and so social acquaintances that she and Thomas had. Jane had a very fine gift. Dear Mary, I must write a line to thank you for your quick compliance with my request and for sending me so much more than I asked for. It was wonderful to see those snowdrops when planted in my little garden here, looking as fresh as they, if they had never left Scotland. It makes me dreadfully sad sometimes to think of the prodigious rapidity and facility of communication now between here and there. Now, when I can get next to no good of it. My mother used often to say to me, how delightful it will be to breakfast here and dine with you in London. I remember that when it was too late, the railroad was opened, but mother, my mother was dead. That sort of intensely human, sometimes funny, sometimes not letter, Jane was very good at. Thomas to his mother, 1850. My dear mother, nothing has gone wrong here, only we're terribly busy. Jane was to write you today, I literally having not a moment. But poor thing, she has got a headache and proves not to have been able to write. So not to alarm your imagination with a long silence, I, just before running out, will write you myself. The change of weather here from fierce frost 
to soft, wet heat, this is April 1850, I suppose has acted on the liver of this and every other household, but we will all profit by the change of weather. I could not be well at any rate. He was always complaining about his health, was Thomas. And as you read the letters, you'll find it's a recurrent theme. Here's Jane in 1850, writing Thomas. He's gone on holiday to stay with Lady Ashburton, who had a nice country house she invited them to. The best train for you to come is the one I came by, which leaves Waterloo at one o'clock and reaches Andover soon after three. It doesn't stop at Vauxhall, remember. You will have deliberate time for breakfasting and doing all your morning odds and ends. If you don't fatigue yourself before you start, the journey will not fatigue you. You see how domestic these letters are. Be sure you bring warm clothes with you, for it is much chillier here than in London. I came away too thinly provided, not having had time to make the due transition from summer gowns to winter gowns. And I've had a good many uncomfortable hours. Tell the, the maid to pack up my old claret coloured merino gown I was wearing in the mornings at home and bring it with you. It won't mind being squeezed, providing it is neatly folded. If you leave Emma some little money, I didn't put her on board wages. I told her to get meat she needed from the butcher and left her half a sovereign to account to me for. Give her another half sovereign on the same principle. And that should do, I think. You see, it's like having a time machine. We can look at the domestic life of London in 1850 and see two intelligent people taking the train, visiting their friends, staying, keeping in touch. Thomas wanted a letter every day when Jane was on holiday. Every day. He didn't always get it, but he sent her one every day. One of the great pleasures that I invite you to have is to take volume 24 of the Carlisle Letters. This was 1849, when Jane, who by this time had been out of Haddington for so long, that she felt sure she could go back without being recognized. Her father was dead, her mother was dead. She'd never had the courage to go back and see the scenes of her youth. She went back incognito in 1849, and it produced, I think, the best bit of writing she ever did. We got back to Morpeth. We dined at the Phoenix. Forster put me into my train, and I was shot off towards Scotland, and he took a train for Ireland. 1850. Jane is writing Thomas to tell him about her visit to Haddington. She never wrote better. From Morpeth to Haddington is a journey of four hours. Can you imagine how the years have passed? Morpeth to Haddington took four hours. The first locality I recognised was the Pease Bridge. I had been there once before as a little child in a post chaise with my father. He held his arm round me while I looked down. It was my first sight of the picturesque. At Dunbar station, an old lady in widow's dress and a young one, her daughter, got into the carriage which I had so far had had all to myself. And a man in yeoman's uniform was waiting to see them off. Jane's ear for dialogue. You may be come and see us the morn's nicht said the young lady from the carriage. What for did you not come to the ball? answered the yeoman, with a look to split a pitcher. The young lady tut-tutted and looked depressed. What for did you not come to the ball? he repeated. The poor young lady tried holding her tongue, but only her lover, only a lover could have used her so brutally, did the same, but rested his chin on the carriage window to scowl at her. The interest was rising. One would see who would speak first. Oh, broke the young lady, I'm just mourning. 
What for? That ball. When? What for did you not come? And Jane can fill pages with this kind of dialogue. Before these ladies got out of Dren, I had identified the pale, old, shriveled widow as being the same buxom, bright-eyed Mrs. Sheriff of my youth. The daughter had not only grown up, but got herself born in the interim. And then Jane arrives in Haddington Station, because in those days there was a railway to Haddington. I looked out timidly, and it all looked so strange. No vehicle was waiting but a dusty little omnibus to carry one. So I got in and I was trundled to the George Inn, where a landlord and waiter, both strangers to me, looking half asleep, showed me to the best room on the first floor. Jane is travelling as an English tourist. She hopes no one will recognise her. A large, old-fashioned, three-windowed room looking out on the main street. And without having spoken one word, they shut the door, and there I was, actually in the George Inn, Haddington, alone amidst the silence of death. I sat down quite composedly at a window and looked up the street, towards my old house. It was the same street, the same houses, but so silent, dead, petrified. It looked the old place just as I had seen it in Chelsea in my dreams, only now it looked more dreamlike. 1860. I called for tea. I notified my wish to view the old church. The keeper of the keys was immediately fetched. I let myself be shown the way that I knew every inch of. Shown the old schoolhouse where myself had been ducks, the playground, the bowling green, and so on to the church. And then a single sentence which shows you what a fine stylist Jane was. The churchyard had become very full of graves. In that one sentence, you see what a great letter writer she could be. The churchyard had become very full of graves. Within the ruin, the two smartly got up tombs. My father's looked old, old, surrounded by nettles, the inscription all over moss, except two lines which had been just recently cleaned. By whom? Who had been there before me and looked after his tomb? The old ruin knew and couldn't tell. And then she goes in and looks at the pews. Our pew looked to have been new lined since we occupied it. The green cloth has become white from age. I looked at it in the dim twilight till I almost fancied I could see my beautiful mother in her old corner and myself a bright looking girl in the other corner. It was time to get out of that. And the whole of this letter goes on like this, a wonderful description of Jane. She thinks no one will recognize her, she's wrong. The man who let her into the church knew straight away who she was. The next day she tries to get into the churchyard before it's unlocked and she jumps over the wall and finds out later on that people saw her and they said that has to be Jeannie Welsh. No one else would be crazy enough to do that. Volume 24 of the Carlisle Letters. Jane's visit to Haddington. It is her very best consistent long piece of writing and I do recommend it as an example of 19th century epistolary writing at its best. Volume 24, page 159, highly recommended. Why was Carlyle such an important figure, the Sage of Chelsea? I've always taken it back to these formative years in Scotland before he went to Chelsea, when he was still thinking in terms of his childhood in Echo Fechen. When Carlyle did finally die, he left behind some essays which are now published as the reminiscences of Thomas Carlyle, which I do commend to you. And he describes his father 
And this, I think, is the crux of why Carlyle was such a great Victorian figure. The more I reflect on it, the more I admire how completely nature had taught my father, how completely he was devoted to his work, to the task of his life, content to let everything pass by that had no relation to this. The core of Carlyle's message to his age was the importance of work. Concentrating on work, working to good principles, and doing nothing else. It is a singular fact, for example, that I believe that my father, although a man of such openness and clarity, had never read three pages of Burns poems. Not even all about him were noisy and enthusiastic, I the loudest, did he feel it worthwhile to renew his investigation. The poetry he liked was truth and wisdom of reality. It was not without aversion that my father regarded Burns, but he was indifferent. I have heard him speak of one seeing Burns standing in Rob Scott's smithy in Echo Fechen, and someone said, there's the poet Burns. And my father went out to look and saw a man with boots on, like a well-dressed farmer, walking down the village on the opposite side. That was all the relation these two men ever had. My father had a solid knowledge of arithmetic, a fine antique handwriting. These with other limited practical etc. were all the things he ever heard mentioned as excellent. He was religious with the consent of his whole faculty. Without reason, he would have been nothing. But that was Annandale, and that was 50 years ago, and the gospel was still preached. That was Annandale, and that was 50 years ago. The mystery of why Carlyle was a great Victorian, I think, lies somewhere in that passage. The values he took from growing up at Echo Fechen, religious values, even though he himself wasn't very religious in old age, values which elevated work, duty, intelligence, and honesty over everything else. Those were the values Carlyle tried to write about and advocate to his age. Carlyle was often called the man who invented the gospel of work. And at a time of upheaval like the Industrial Revolution, it was really important that he try to persuade his age with all the arrival of steam engines and railways and foreign wars and import and export, that people had to have a work ethic and a value ethic. The first essay which brought Carlyle to public attention, which is well worth your seeking out, you can get it anywhere on the internet, is called Signs of the Times, 1829, just before Carlyle settles in London. But he's sitting on the edge. The Industrial Revolution is happening down south. Carlyle is still in Scotland. And he says, what's happening in our society today? And as an outsider, he has the chance to see it clearly. If we had to re require to characterize our age by any one word, I would say it is the age of machinery. Machinery in every outward and inward sense. Nothing is now done directly or by hand. Everything is by rule and contrivance. There is some way of doing things now, the living artisan driven from his workshop to make room for a machine. The shuttle drops from the fingers of the weaver and falls into iron fingers that ply it faster. The sailor furls his sail, lays down his oar and bids a strong servant of steam bear him through the waters. There is no end to machinery. Even the horse, is stripped of his harness 
and finds a fire fleet horse invoked in his stead. For all earthly and for some unearthly purposes, we have machines and mechanic furtherances. For mincing our cabbages, for casting us into sleep, we move mountains and make seas our smooth highways. It's funny, you can hear the pre-echo, can't you, of the fear people have today of what artificial intelligence will do. And un understood, uncontrollable force that lies ahead. Carlyle, sitting in Scotland at a distance from the Industrial Revolution, sees it with this outsider's eye. But he writes, not the external and physical alone is now managed by machinery, but the internal and spiritual. And there you hear the key message from Carlyle. Not the outside and the physical alone is now managed by machinery, but the internal and spiritual. Everything has its cunningly disguised shortcuts. Natural strength avails little. These things, although we can state them lightly, are of deep importance. For the same habit regulates not just what we do, but how we think. Men are grown mechanical in head and in heart, as well as in hand. And that, I think, sums up the core of Carlyle's message to his age. Men are grown mechanical in head and in heart, as well as in hand. All through the 20s and 30s, Carlyle wrote about the depersonalizing, savage effects the mechanical revolution had on the working classes. Ask yourself why Dickens dedicated Hard Times in 1854 to Thomas Carlyle Esquire, because in that novel, which shows you human beings more or less cut down to work in factories, owned by a man who doesn't know their names, he just calls them hands. Men are grown mechanical in head and in heart, as well as in hands. The depersonalizing of people as machines is the theme that runs through early Carlyle. And then in the mature years of his career, what can we do? What can we do to stop the machine swallowing up mankind? And he goes back to Echo Fechen, to Scotland, to those values that he learned there. Work, reverence. Political reverence, Carlyle never joined a political party, but he certainly believed in a well-structured stru society that cared for the poor as well as the rich. And he poured scorn on an idle aristocracy that swallowed up without contributing. And work. Work, work, work. That is the theme that runs through all Carlyle's major writing. And he tells his age, work is important and everyone should do it. It shouldn't take you down to the level of a beast. It should allow you to live life full. And if you also have moral values, then you can live a rich and complete life. 1831-32, he writes Sartor Resartus, probably the most influential book that carries that message. And then all through the 1830s and 40s, he writes a series of hard-hitting books, of which the most famous Heroes and Hero Worship is about how society is in danger of losing its way and needs to find and identify heroes who will lead society in the right directions. As he grew older, Carlyle grew more authoritarian, and he's considerably out of favor in many areas today because people feel he wasn't sufficiently alert to the social changes of his time because he tended to go back to the more rigid but supportive structures of his youth. But people are now beginning to realize that although Carlyle could, in old age, sound authoritarian, what he advocated 
what he got from Scotland, what he advocated to the whole of Britain, to America, where he was vastly influential, and to the whole English speaking world, to say nothing of translations of Carlyle, which are in their hundreds, was an ordered, structured society. And in the middle of the maelstrom of changes, which was the 19th century and the Industrial Revolution, he offered the idea of a structured society where each individual could live a satisfying, ordered life that interacted positively with others instead of trying to claw money or value out of other people. He had a huge following in his lifetime. When he died, the newspapers were thick with black edged front pages. He was offered Westminster Abbey, but he preferred to be buried with his mother in Hodham Kirkyard in Echo Fechen. As I say, his reputation has taken a dip since then, partly when people read his letters and realised that he and Jane were two ordinary clever people who quarrelled a lot because they put it all into their letters without restraint. People who thought Carlyle was a calm, ordered de deity who sat on a hill somewhere discovered he was a short-tempered man with a bad digestion. And they saw that Jane could have a biting, witty pen. But now, all that has died down. And the coming of the Carlyle letters opens to us the sight of two intensely clever, well-educated, well-read, well-connected, friendly people who made friends and kept friends and brilliantly used their friendship to write letters. How many of us will leave behind 10,000 emails? How many emails will survive us? What the Carlyle letters have given us is an immensely valuable record, which because he hoarded and she hoarded has come down to us in this incredible quantity. We know that Carlisle letters were burned and we're still finding new ones. There was a big sale in Sotheby's three or four weeks ago, of more Carlisle stuff. But thanks to the internet, the Carlisle letters are now online. And as new come in, they can be slotted into the right place. You can imagine my terror when I started in, in this. I've been doing this since 1964. I was afraid that as soon as we published something, something else would turn up and we'd have to rearrange and re-index everything. But thankfully, the computer does that for us now. If you're looking for a quick way into Carlisle, the best way, obviously, is in the letters. If you'd like to have a sense of Jane, that 1849 visit to Haddington, in volume 24 is a great place to start. If you'd like to get a slightly more cohesive sense of Carlyle than plowing through volume after volume of the letters, there is no better place to start than the reminiscences. There's a modern edition from Oxford Press. You can find them in every library. I would recommend that you start with the reminiscences of his father and then just read the lot and slowly you'll build up a picture of this old, weary, sometimes cantankerous, but wonderfully alive and alert writer who pours out the story of his life. And behind it, you can see Scotland all the way from 1812, when Jane's first letter that survives is there to 1867, when he finished the reminiscences and put down his pen. And it's as if watching Scotland come alive through his full and incredibly devoted life. You can see the reality of what it was like to be there at the time and to try to immerse yourself in it in imagination. Scottish literature is lucky to have Carlyle's, both of them. Their correspondence is one of the glories of Scottish literature. And while Carlyle is known the world over as an eminent Victorian, 
I think the Duke Edinburgh edition of the Carlisle Letters now cements their place together as one of the primary places where we can learn more about the 19th century. And that's it. Um, thank you very much, Ian.